Good day, Chris. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Oh, my pleasure, Guy. It's actually kind of an honor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this is turnabout, I guess, because you guys have had me on your program, and I, I took my coffee cup upstairs, darn it, and I left it in the microwave. Yeah, that's exactly well, what I was going to I, I, I just or have... I have a replica. <laughs> I, I just happen to have one right here. So yeah. Very good. Yeah, but uh, so I've been on your program twice in the past, and I, I'm mm -hmm. meaning to uh, uh, get you on my series. Uh, but uh, let's start off with uh, doing an introduction of you for our audience. And I've got several questions to help dig into your past and kind of bring us to the present day. But uh, for our audience, would you introduce yourself, tell us your name, and, and tell us where did you grow up? Yeah, uh, my name is, uh, my full name is Christopher Jasper Robert Van Wingerden. I don't I, I, I don't normally get to throw all of that out there um, <laughs> in win one go. Um, I grew up mostly in eastern Ontario uh, in a small town about an hour west of Ottawa, um, which Ottawa is the capital of Canada, medium-sized city, about a, about a million-ish people uh, these days, but not quite that big when I was growing up. But um, yeah, small town life. And um, yeah. That was so kind of where did you uh, years. where did you go to school and what did you study? Yeah, so um, after leaving, you know, graduating high school in that small town, um, I went to McGill University um, and uh, was studying English, English literature. And part of my draw to McGill was um, uh, not going to lie, Leonard Cohen. Uh, uh, I was a big Leonard Cohen fan in high school, uh, music fan, literature fan, and I. Thought well, if you're going to be a um, an important Canadian writer, can't can't get much better than going to the place that uh, you, you know created or or, or gave <laughs> a lot of you know help to uh, Leonard Cohen. So that was my my thing. Um, I ended up not finishing. I've got an odd an odd path through through life. Um, not a very straight not not the standard path. Um, I ended up not finishing, and but I did end up finishing my degree um, actually at another university called Queen's University, which is in uh, an even smaller city called Kingston, Ontario, on the shores of Lake Ontario. Um, so I finished my degree there. I was still working in literature, um, but I did finish that as a as a as a part time student, creeping into being an adult an adult student. Although I'm not sure. Uh, the, the the math of the age when I finally graduated would have me as an adult student, but I never did feel like too much like a grown up in a sense in some ways. So um, an interesting kind of fun thing about that is the, um, uh, the those two universities, McGill and Queens, have a long standing heated rivalry. So um, I ended up graduating from a school where I didn't do, you know, frosh week or anything like that. So I was not um, I was not inculcated, <laughs> I guess. And there are at, at Queen's University, there are a lot of traditions. There are um, it, uh, et cetera that you get introduced to during Frosh Week. So I, I was going to classes and, and people, you know, references to things. And I'm like, OK, sure. I'm just here to take notes, <laughs> you know, to a certain degree. Um, so that was my 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 college path um, or my first university path. Um, it's interesting uh, being Canadian. I see the word college, and um, up here it actually has a slightly different meaning than than it might for folks in America. Um, we have kind of a twofold post secondary structure typically, where there's universities, um, but then there are also colleges, and colleges are more focused or traditionally focused on uh, on trades or or uh, training type programs. So. Um, you might go to uh, college to do graphic design uh, programs, um, or you might go to university and do a fine arts degree, you know, for in a, in a university program that way. So the different different kinds of pathways into different things. So, um, yes, yeah, so my 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 default word really is university rather than than college. Um, so then later on, and, and we'll probably talk about this because it's worth sort of exploring a little bit further, but I ended up doing a, a second degree later on um, in the, in our space here. I have a, a I have a, a degree in adult education from um, Brock university, which is in St. Catharines, which is mm, kind of like close to Niagara falls and not far from there. Um, and I did that as a distance learning program. In fact, 
I went down from my graduation after completing that degree, and it was the um, the second time that I'd ever set foot on the actual campus because the program that I did was entirely uh, remote and online, et cetera. So, so that's my that's my formal university type ish background. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. So, so tell us where do you live now and and work? Yeah, so I live actually basically in the same hood that I grew up in, <laughs> that same small town area about an hour west of Ottawa. Um, and work-wise, uh, I work here at Domino Learning Systems, makers of Domino One and uh, sponsors of the Instructional Designers in Offices weekly podcast. Um, and so Domino's headquarters are on the west edge of, of Ottawa. So I uh, I work here in the office. Uh, not 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 regularly, you know. COVID and such, we we're still not back fully in the office. But the office is uh, uh, about an hour's commute for me. But it's 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 not highway or or heavy traffic driving, so it's a pretty low key drive from that perspective. So yeah, we I work here out of Domino's uh, headquarters where I happen. Well, to tell us a little bit more about Domino and the yeah. products and services you guys render and and the marketplaces you serve. Yeah, yeah. So. We're actually this month, um, two days ago, three days ago, was actually the company's 25th anniversary, which is um, really kind of wacky in this world where where we have so many tech things that pop up and then either, you know, disappear or, or get, you know, merged or what, what have you. So 25 years um, independent existence. Um, the company originally uh was was founded and uh, and was creating e-learning courses back actually in the days of CD-ROM. So it was a um, off-the-shelf courses vendor and um, courses in the electronics manufacturing, uh, wireless technology kind of areas. And then this internet thing came along, and there was this you know task then to take this stuff and make it something that people could consume instead of having to ship a CD-ROM around um let, let's see what we can do you know with the internet so and, and you know lms has started to emerge in that time frame as a as a, a thing and uh in fact pre-scorm still at this point in time so um so the the process of moving from cd-rom to something internet based um we actually ended up creating um essentially uh, uh what we would still describe as a learning content management system for authoring content and creating content Solving our own problem actually met, led to, oh, maybe this is actually a product that other people could then benefit from. So they, the, it was taken out as a, or, or pushed out into the world as a, as a product, the first generation of that. Um, and that was about 20 years ago. And that's about when I started, well, a little bit more than 20 years ago, last January was my 20th anniversary with Domino. So, 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 we, we have so you, so you left college, you left uh, the university and uh with your second degree and and join Domino right then? No, actually. So again, here's my meandering path, right? Uh, so work at, uh, as I was completing my 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 bachelor uh, my English degree, I was working um, also at uh, basically in a, in a bookstore group. Uh, so I was managing a small bookstore, etc. So I had that kind of world, um, and then after that. Um, I ended up working in a um, at a newspaper. So I don't have a formal journalism background, but I, I did ease into that world. So I did that for about seven years um, after my first degree. And uh, my connection to Domino came, um, a colleague um, at another newspaper uh, said, hey, talk to this guy. He needs some help editing some stuff. Oh, okay. So I started doing some stuff for 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 Domino just on an editing side, and then found myself all of a sudden, uh, about four or five months later. Well, why don't you just write the next project? So suddenly, I found myself <laughs> sitting, you know, in in the Word document, actually creating the you know the uh, the instructional design portion, and and then storyboarding, etc. Um, and basically, that kind of emerged into a, a job offer to join Domino full time. So I left journalism. And uh, and yeah, joined as I say, Domino full time. Then so, um, was working you know at Domino for for several years and realized that you know what I need to uh, I've I've been brought into this space and I have a lot of hunches. <laughs> I also have a lot of things that I've been presented with as as techniques or, or things etc that are 
um, but well, you know, sort of an apprenticeship model, inheriting the things that people have done, you know, before me. I realized though that I I, I had to you know bone up on uh, on on, the, on you know the good things. You know, what are the best practices? Those sorts of things. So that's when I went back and did my uh, my bachelor's in uh, education in adult education. Um, uh, that was a five year process because I was doing that while working full time. As I say, it was a fully online program, which was actually given the space that we work in, e learning. You know been my world so um to be able to actually subject myself to that um and as a kind of a meta experience too not just the the core information etc but the the experience and uh yeah as i say subjecting myself to it uh, as a as a at the very least as a project of empathy <laughs> development but also just you know okay does this work for this this kind of thing work for me feeling my way through those kinds of things too mm-hmm. So let's let's circle back to the uh, learning content management system because I think mm-hmm. it's fascinating. I'm not too sure that many people really understand. You know what is that, and yeah. what affordances does it offer? Yeah. So uh, one of the things about our industry, and maybe every industry, but our industry in particular, we sure love our acronyms. Um, and one of the unfortunate things about um, the type of tool that we have here at Domino is that uh, the acronym for it is LCMS. Um, and yet, and uh, so there's often a, a confusion, you know, right away with the acronym with LMS. Um, so um, when I think of an LMS, a learning management system, I think of like the office in your school what, back in the day, right? It's the place where the student records are sco- stored. It's the place where the uh, next year's um you know, schedules are made and, and classes are, are you know, it's, it's about aligning or, or putting, you know, people and, and, and learning opportunities or courses or whatever together and then tracking those results on your permanent record, you know, uh, that kind of a thing. And so unfortunately, uh, a learning content management system sounds an awful lot like that. So that's the first thing we usually have to tell people is that, yeah, it's not, that's not what we do. We're not the office in the school, you know. Um, but But essentially, I mean, what we've got is, is um, an authoring tool for creating e-learning, uh, micro-learning, uh, other learning opportunities as well, such as, um, you know, job aids, searchable knowledge bases, things beyond simply e-learning courses, et cetera. Um, and rather than a desktop tool, you're working in a, in a web experience, which means that we can do things like we can share content across different projects. So you might have, um, you might have five courses to onboard people into a new role and but then you can create one more project where all of the things that are uh you know task or 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 you know those kinds of uh, job action related things you can put all of those lessons and all that stuff that you've already created you can share it then into something else and publish that as a searchable knowledge base so you've got your five scoring packages that are going to run in the lms and and everybody's passing everybody's you know etc and three weeks after they've completed the training online now they're in the in the actual working space and you know human memory is fallible <laughs> believe it or not people forget things uh you know so so you with minimal extra effort you've also then by creating a searchable knowledge base you've given them the things that they need to be actually able to perform and apply without having to pull them out of uh you know the process necessarily uh etc so an, an lcms um, gives you abilities to to do things beyond just an authoring tool, particularly around content reuse, content sharing. Um, really can bring you forward into the the idea of single source content designing um, and, and those sorts of things, and you know lots of reporting and stuff around uh, around what that uh, kind of a tool can help you with. So, yeah, I'm I've been a proponent of uh, reuse of content, either as is or after modification since the 1980s. And mm-hmm. it's tools like this that really kind of started in in the media companies. And as a journalist, as, a, as somebody who worked in that space, you may have seen some of that, but I remember people talking about, okay, so you have some, some content and you want to publish it in your newspaper and in your magazine and on television and on the radio, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a way to kind of centralize that, but then disperse it through these different channels. Mm -hmm. So I I always thought that that had a lot of power. Um, It's just like manufacturing companies uh, making different versions of a product with different feature sets 
and there's a core to it. And then there's the additional features that differentiate, you know, the good, better, best kind of a, a product uh, differentiation. But uh, so I'm, I'm very encouraged that the, the, the field has something like this. And I would like to help, you know, promote that kind of thinking, because I think that too often we create content that's kind of throwaway. Mm -hmm. We create a lot of redundant content when it was not necessary. But if you don't have the tools, it's sometimes seen as just easier, quicker to just create a different version of something from scratch almost. And, uh, and you know, that's that's uh, wasteful for the whoever the owners are, whoever the shareholders are. That's for sure. Shame. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, we 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 have client teams where uh, you you know global organizations who have separate you know sub training groups or whatever etc. And recognition um, one very large pharma company in particular that their reason for even looking for our a type of tool was the recognition that they have so much overlap and they're making so much content independently. Why are we all doing? more or less the same thing can we do it you know better once rather than having three different teams making three different sets of training which is covering the exact same you know kind of stuff so so um you know in their model because it's because it's pharma there's also regulatory differences in different countries etc so it's not simply uh the taking of something and then delivering it you know everywhere but you know content will start in one place um and then the next group well okay for this particular um drug we can't say this because it's not actually able to be prescribed for this specifically it's not approved for that but these other things so it's it's um you know there's content reuse and there's localization aspects to it as well as language translation processes that our, our tool helps facilitate too into those uh into all of those other markets but um uh but now they no longer have you know five different teams creating five different uh, course content and um, and slight variations and they get standards and consistency of information too yeah i think that's very powerful i i did a project uh, back in the early 2000s with the norfolk naval shipyard and one of the things that we determined was a performance-based need was active listening for a couple manager roles and my client went and, and to find out you know what did the navy the u.s navy have on active listening and he found 27 different two-hour modules on on active listening and he had to he had to watch all 27 of them spend 54 hours trying to decide which two-hour version should we and he said they were all pretty much the same slight variations unnecessary differences and uh but you know that's a uh, that's very wasteful so i i wish you guys a lot of luck in promoting mm. this approach and, and your tool uh, because I think it's it's going to be very helpful for learning and development organizations to do much much better. Mm. If I can, let me shift gears here a little bit. So, sure thing. so my series here is uh, HPT videos, uh, human performance technology, known as human performance improvement, or a bunch of other names. But it's basically about evidence based practices in performance improvement, in, which is inclusive of learning and development. Um, but can you share with us uh, your uh, entree to that world, those concepts and that, and and what you might call those kinds of approaches where you're taking a more or less evidence-based uh, approach to things? Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I started, started um, working with Domino initially, you know, part-time, et cetera, I was, I was presented with a pretty specific framework of, of what was this, what this e-learning thing that we were going to make was and it was um it was a model that was um we a very uh numerically based 20 percent of everything so so 20 percent of the content had to be video 20 percent of the content had to be um still images 20 percent of the content had to be um, it's, so there was a kind of media framework. We wanted 20% of everything mm -hmm. so that we were, the, and the idea was that, you know, that way we're covering all of the ways that people might find, I'm not going to use the word learning styles because I don't <laughs> think the word learning styles was specifically mentioned, but it has, you know, it, it had an evocation of the idea, you know, of learning styles. Mm -hmm. Some people are uh, visual learners, etc. Um, so I, I was presented with this framework, and and that was that was how we were creating you know e learning content, and and so there was a you know I was able to craft things that fit into this box that I you know this 
set of pigeonholes in a sense that um, that we were presented with. And then, um, but I'm, I'm brand spanking new to this stuff, right? I mean, I'm a decent writer. Uh, I'm I can talk to a SME. I can pull the info out, etc. Okay, now I can put it into this into this framework. And then, uh, you know, it was also the era when blogs really like exploded, right? Everybody. So, and that's, I was absolutely, um, you know, a beneficiary of, of that world. You could read five blogs in an evening and, and get a whole pile and you're just getting, you know, it's almost like a fire hose, right? New terms, new things, new ideas. And, you know, your brain's going, Ooh, there's so much, you know, you know, going on. Um, and I think through, through a, that exposure then to ideas, because I, um, like I said, I didn't come into this space with a formal education and what we do. I came, I went back and I got that formal education, when I recognize my my limitations, really, um, but you start seeing things like you know the Addy model. Everybody's talking about the Addy model, the Addy model, and you get into that. But then, um, and you're going, oh, cool, we do all of this, and then you look at the E and you go, evaluation. Oh, oh, okay, no, we're just making stuff and and kind of just putting it out there to a certain degree, um, or the you know the Kirkpatrick model for ROI, and you're going. Oh wow! What's the business results of that? Or, or, or you know, what were those? So that that recognition of that, you know, this, this whole other level of things that we need to be aware of. Not simply creating something that's a, an inform, you know, a, a good experience or or something like that of presenting information. But what's the purpose of it? Well, the purpose is either you know changing behavior, um, or, or or organizational you know benefits like reduce costs, reduce risk, or or you know those kinds of things that we really need to always say, oh, that's, that's the goal. That's the, um, that's the end result thing. So, um, so getting exposure, you know, through the world of blogs and, and my gosh, we have so many people um, in our space who were so generous. I mean, I can, when you think back, the sheer number of people who were blogging and how did they work and, <laughs> you know, produce a blog. Sometimes some of these folks were posting, you know, more than once a week or whatever. It's like uh, um, amazing. So, um, I'm a definite, you know, beneficiary from uh, from that that generosity. I would say a generosity of time and that generosity of, etc. But it gave me an exposure to so many things. And then you start drilling down, right? You're finding, uh, you know, more details on these things, etc. Um, and so partly that's what led me to then go go to Brock to do my my degree there to, you know, as I say, to bolster my my formal. Uh, learning in 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 this world a bit more rather than just uh, bouncing around on hunches and, and and that sort of a thing. So that to me, that's you know sort of the place where I started triggering or started triggering my brain that oh, there's there's more to this than simply you know sh- throwing information at the wall in a sense. Um, what is it that you know re- the real goal is um, that, uh, that that you want people to achieve, and those and how does that align then with in the case of what we do, organizational learning pardon me, or sorry, organizational goals, uh, et cetera. So that's that's where um, the idea of measurement and evidence and those sorts of things started entering my thinking process, not merely then going, you know, focusing simply on information and how do I present that best to people, but what are we really doing with the information or what do we want people to do with the information um, that we present to them? So that's that's, you know, somewhere in that, in my first sort of four or five years in, in our space, I, you know, a lot of encounters with blogs and, and things like that, which um, introduced me, I guess, really to the idea then of, of the importance of thinking, you know, how do we know, how do we measure, et cetera, as part of a project, not simply the what do we want them to to know or what do we want to tell them in a sense. So, mm-hmm. so can you share with us? Uh, we're going to get to a question later on about uh, more current day influence. Mm-hmm. So this is this is really for our audience in terms of who were some of your earliest influences, either people or books or articles that you can share with us that that might be of interest to some of our audience. So what what was impactful to you back in the day? Yeah, yeah. Um, probably the the first thing that that I would cite as an influence that way is, um, is Ruth Clark's book, e-learning and the science of instruction. Um, like I said, I had this model that I was presented with and boom, this is what we do. And so you make the things fit the information, fit that. Um, and I thought, Oh, I'm going to get, I got this book. Um, and I read through it and, and wow, smack right in the head. Oh crap. We do that. And that's apparently not good. Oh crap. Mm-hmm. We've done that in courses and that's apparently not good. Um, even just you know simple assumptions, so much, um, and and you still see it. But um, uh, the the in an e-learning course, having 
words and then the exact words also being read by narration. And it turns out that that's not a very effective way for people to learn because they're trying to balance now two types of input and those things actually, you know, compete more than they actually merge together, et cetera. And um, so that was, that was a startling revelation because the e-learning courses that we were making had the words on the page and the narration, you know, and that was the model that, that I was, I was given to, to, to live up to. Um, we had a really cool project that we got to do with a, with a, a financial services organization. Um, and it was a project that um, was about asking open questions. And it was a branching based, uh, you were in the role of a financial services person talking to a client. And they have a form that they're supposed to fill out their you know, client profile sheet. But rather than asking, how, you know, how many employees do you have? What's your, you know, trying to use open questions so that you get insight into things that you might not hear otherwise, rather than just filling in the sheet. So branching based scenario interview concept with, with, with client, with, with clients done, uh, you know, client characters, et cetera. And um, that project had as part of it, a trivia game. So every once in a while, we'd throw up a trivia question and you could earn gold coins, you know, so you, it was, but here I am flipping through Ruth Clark's book and going, oh, wait a minute you know, that kind of an activity, we think of it as engaging or, 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 oh, it'll be fun or it'll add a, well, no, because who cares about trivia? It's not about the, the skill set. It's not connected to the actual skill set that we're trying to teach people. So it's a diversion. It's a distraction. Um, and, and, and truthfully, somewhat kind of like childlike too, to be treating adults too, with a little, you know, set of coins, that you're getting in the context of you, you're here, you are interviewing people who are representative of real world clients, you know, and then, oh, we're going to flip over to the to coins, et cetera. So discovering, you know, um, that there is study and research, uh, you know, in that book, e-learning in, this, in the science of instruction, which I've got two different editions of, uh, you know, I think I've got the first edition and then they did so much further work. It's like, no, I got to get me the third one too. I think there's actually now a fourth of it as well. So, so that was one of the first things where I stepped back and said, okay, the, the box, the, the framework that I've been given has some, uh, has some problems in it and uh, we got to do better, et cetera. Um, then a couple of other places, a couple of other people um, that I bumped into along the way, um, Will Talheimer's work on spaced repetition um, and recognizing that, oh, this is a, a, another tool that we, that we can use to lead to application, better application, et cetera, in different forms. Um, and then uh, Bob Mosier and Conrad Gottfriedson's Five Moments of Need was another framework that it, that it came along and I went, oh, oh, this jives with, you, know, you can see the, the application there uh, with, with spaced repetition, you know, that people don't just learn from formal learning, they learn, you know, in different times of need. And um, really also balanced, I think, or, or tied in with the kind of work that, that, that our own tool can do, which is, you know, formal learning, but also, uh, you know, uh, application-based learning in this, in the time of need type, uh, stuff too. So those are some of the early ones, but that, that, that book of Ruth Clark's was like, um, like literally reading it and going, oh, you, you know, oh my God, we do that. We've got to stop doing that. You know, because the science says it's not good. It doesn't work, you know, based on so many assumptions about, um, you know, how people learn or understand and then tearing some of that down. So, mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. Um, so let me shift gears again here a little. Mm -hmm. if, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech, you know, we want to give some examples to our audience in terms of you know, when you get hit with this question, you know, what 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 can you say? So. If you're at a garden party or something and a new neighbor comes by and says, you know, Chris, what do you do? What would be your 30 second elevator speech on what it is that you do? That's that exact kind of scenario um, is, is such a bane of my existence, because what we do in some ways is is very niche. It's very um, it, so it, it really is difficult to summarize sometimes down to something succinct. Um, my own kids don't exactly know what I do and they're adults and I've been doing this for most of their lives. They have a vague sense, but if their, you know, friends said, well, what does your dad do? Uh, well, something like this or whatever, you know, I've, uh, I have a brother-in-law who, who, uh, refers to me or, or thinks of me as writing, um, product manuals because somewhere along the way, I probably kind of use that as a model to explain. And he, that, that's the part that latched on, you know, for him. 
So I used to try to explain to people that I was an, I'm an instructional designer, which makes, you know, I, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then the eyes roll over and glazed over and they go, oh, oh, okay. So, and so it doesn't really help in the context of, uh, of, of, of meeting someone basically new, but my, my short version of what I do, what I think of, how I think of what I do is I help people. So I have different parts of my role. So that might be helping Domino One users understand the tool and use it and improve their use of it, et cetera. Um, but also as a manager you know, within the company, I have a team. So it's my role to help my teammates, uh, my team members uh, you know, achieve their goals, set them up for success, et, et cetera. So I, I, I focus on that word helping. Um, but if someone says, you know, what's your job? I sometimes have to go back to that. Well, I'm an instructional designer by trade and, uh, you know, et cetera. But um, so, yeah, it's it's such a, a, a thing for us sometimes to describe what we do because we all of a sudden get into these really arcane phrases and, and ger- terminology and jargon too that people like to say, oh, okay, that's interesting. Ah, okay. So. It's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a a tough thing to kind of boil it down and, and make it accessible to whoever you're talking to. And the, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's been a, a joke in the business since I've been in the business. Cause I remember in the early eighties, one of the people at MSPI, which is now ISPI used to, used to get up at the podium and, and a, at a, 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 a keynote speech and he would, he would read a letter from his mama. <laughs> his mama was always challenging him to explain exactly, you know, what the hell it is you do because she couldn't figure it out. And it was always hilarious, but, but it resonated with everybody because no, you know, it's hard to explain it to the uninitiated. I, I had relatives who would, would constantly challenge me every time I'd see them, you know, once or twice a, a, a year or so. And, and they would ask me, so what again is it that you do? I mean, it's, it's, it is hard to explain, but, but if you were ever riding with that potential client on an elevator and you have a very short time, you had to have something to say. Well, for sure. Let me shift gears here once more. Mm-hmm. Chris, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us what your current focus or next focus for learning might be? And are you doing any writing or where might people, you know, are you sharing this someplace and other people mm. on it? Yeah. Um I, the things that I, 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 I am actively trying to learn these days are, are, are more personal than um, I'm not so much. I mean, I, I'm always sort of in touch with and scanning the blogs and, and such, et cetera. But um, if I think about, you know, that's kind of a passive learning. It's a, you know, oh, something triggers and you go, oh, I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit or whatever. But um, my active learning process these days is, uh, is music based. Um, I've, I've played guitar for a long time. But I wouldn't say I've ever been really good at it. And it's not that I want to be a shredder and, uh, y- you know, or something. But um, I, I really I am trying uh, actively to learn more about and become a better musician, both from a theory perspective, um, as well as just uh, the playing perspective. Um, and that's if I when I when I'm able to carve out time, you know, between work and 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 home responsibilities, et cetera, that's the thing that I will do is I will I will pick up the guitar and work on on something. That said, I'm kind of bad at it because I, I don't actually specify that I'm going to practice for for one hour. Um, so it, it comes and goes and et cetera. But that is the thing where I if uh, when I think about what I want to learn, I want to learn to to um, to be better at that. So that's that's my current learning thing that and you know the occasional need to oh uh for instance last night i had to learn how to strap kayaks to a j rack on the top of uh, my car for instance so uh a, a momentary two two youtube videos later and i'm an expert but it, but other than solving immediate problems a, a sort of a formal learning activity that i uh, is music is the, the place where i would be turning to so Boy, does that resonate with me? I started taking lessons when I was eight, and I play today as if I was uh, maybe not quite eight and a half. <laughs> and I and I pick up my guitar and strum on it maybe five minutes a year. I mm. I have some in the background here, but I but they're covered with dust, and you can tell that you know these have been uh, ignored. Um, uh, so, let, my next question then is about the language in our field. Uh, because it's always been an issue. So I wanted to give people an opportunity to talk about a term or a phrase from the performance improvement, learning and development 
world that 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 you would like to define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you want to put your own spin on it but what might you have for us in that regard yeah so coming you know so much from the e-learning world um there's a phrase that is is ubiquitous in our in the e-learning space but it always makes me go okay what do you mean or 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 why um and that's engagement um we want to make engaging and interactive e-learning or, um, you know, highly engaging uh, content. And I think that the pursuit of engagement, first of all, doesn't necessarily always align with actual learning. It doesn't give us a measurement that um, doesn't lead us directly into measuring that something actually changed or got improved. Um, it kind of leads us only to the smile sheet level of, you know, of evaluation. Was it engaging? Oh, I had fun, right? Um it also, I think, tends to, it can become a distraction or a removal from the core thing that we need to do. Like that trivia game, uh, you know, with the coins that I was mentioning, well, that's actually, you know, an interference, even though the idea was to lighten this up, make it fun. But, oh, in the middle of a conversation process with a, with a client, I'm going to, you know, do some bank history trivia questions. Okay. Um it also leads us to do a lot of things in, in e-learning because we technologically can. Um, I, I'm a grump about drag and drops. Like when in my life am I going to actually, as part of my job, be categorizing sets of words into two categories that I need to use a drag and drop activity for? Like how does, maybe, you know, some cases, but um, you know, if drag and drop, if the thing you're teaching me doesn't actually have a spatial relationship, don't make me put things into different places on the screen. If I have to learn how to assemble something and I got to put those parts in all the right places, dang right, let's do it. That's that's applicable. But, you know, drag and drop as a kind of learning activity, in the most case, it, I, personally, I find it, it's a child's type tool. It's not really an adult approach to something. And uh, so so engagement is a, is a term that I think of that encompasses a lot of the things that either distract from the core purpose of what we need to do. Um, and I think it can also sometimes lead to us making bad budget decisions. Um, you, you know, are we working on something to make it engaging or is it just faster for us to give people the information and then put them in a situation where they can apply it or something like that, right? Whereas, oh, well, we you know, we want people to like sometimes, you know, the, the content. Um, and it also helps us, it also can, can lead to us forgetting that, you know, learning is work. If you are learning a new task, a new skill, um, it, it's, it's work and it, 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 it can sometimes, you know, be hard, but we have to make it in. in so, and, and I think it also ignores the fact that a lot of content, if, if you're trying to do your job better, you're already engaged in the content, right? You've got, oh, um, you know, a sales course. Well, I want to learn because I want to sell more because I want to make more money. Well, you're already, you know, engaged. Do we have to add a layer of, of something over top of that necessarily? Um, or, uh, you know, just, I want to be able to do the job because I need to go home. You know, so there's, there's, you know, that intrinsic motivation, sometimes the, you know, the idea that we have to improve engagement means we layer things on that, that don't necessarily are, are not assistive to the, to the learning process. Don't meet necessarily help us actually meet the goal of what we need the content to or the, the, the training program to do. Um, I think of a phrase, I'm going back to the blog era, uh, you know, the big blog era, um, Cami Bean, coined a phrase, clicky, clicky, bling, bling. Um, and that just pops up in my mind, it, you know, oh, we can make people, oh, people could click a, you know, a button to show some information. Okay. Or we could just show them the information and explain how, you know, so, uh, and, and I've made lots of that content that, that has that, you know, you know, oh, you know, things that we can do, but it, it really also, I think we have a, we have a moral responsibility to ask, you know, why are we adding this on? What's the, uh, you know, how does it directly affect the learning goal as opposed to the fact that we can make it happen because we've got cool things that we can author stuff in. So, so yeah, that's, I, that's, I, that's, I so that's much agree point. with what you're saying. Yeah, we, we have a tendency to jazz things up or or do something to make it more fun when that's not necessary to the learning. And as you say, mm -hmm. a huge distraction. So let's talk a little bit about some of the people that you might point to for our audience 
that are more currently influencing you. I mean, you have this weekly podcast that both audio and, and video podcast that you guys do, and you meet a lot of people. And so, you know, I don't want you to necessarily rattle off all the names, but but for the our audience, if we were to assume that they're generally going to be somewhat new to the field, or at least let's let's start with that, who might you want to point them to uh, based on your exposure to people who can can help them climb the learning and performance curves that they face. Yeah. So it, every week we get to meet, um, you know, somebody who's doing something interesting. And every conversation that we have, I always come out of it going, that was, you know, that was a lot of fun, you know, and you do learn you know, new things, et cetera. Um, when I step back from, like, we did 40 episodes last year. Um, Next week is our first episode back after our summer holiday, and that'll be actually be our 200th episode. So we've, we've got quite the list of, of, of things that, you know, when I think, um, though, more focused about the people who I mostly, most specifically take something away from or, or added new skills from for myself, et cetera, um, they, they're, well, having Conrad Gottfriedson on uh, with the five moments of need, but his sort of more recent work and thoughts on that was like, Oh, Oh, I like where he's going with that. And, and um, um, we've had Clark Quinn on and I've even back to the blogging days, Clark has, has been someone who's, who's, you know, presentation into the world has, has been something that I've always gone to, um, you know, very evidence-based and, uh, and focused on the core of what we should be doing. Um, past year, we had Robin DeFelice on um, the topic is micro learning, which is a thing that, kind of amorphous in our world and everybody defines it, you know, differently, et cetera. Um, and, but what I really valued about that conversation was um, that, you know, she's very data focused, uh, research focused on, on best practices on that and kind of a no BS, <laughs> you, you know, uh, a, let's call it a warm, no BS, uh, you know, kind of approach to, to, to looking at that. Um, and I, you know, I remember coming out of that conversation going, yep, there's, there's stuff that uh, we can use. Uh, Patty Shank, who most recently has been doing research um, and a book around uh, multiple choice questions, which is like every one of us has to write multiple choice questions. And yet oh, we probably make so many bad choices in, in doing those because we, we we've all well, since middle school, we've all been taking multiple choice tests. Right. So we all we all know. Oh, we all know multiple choice questions it's osmosis we we know it but but what a fabulous you know dig into the research how to properly and, and best practices around setting those up so that you're not just you know creating chaos i guess um and then then lastly uh not this year but previous season um we had david merrill on who is uh uh you know such a long history, you know, in our space, foundational, I would describe that, you know, thinker based on his, his time in, um, and just even being able to hear him reflect on his first principles of instruction, which overlaps so much of what we've talked about here, you know, um, uh, focusing us, you know, taking new knowledge to be applied by the learner and integrating it into the learner's world. So beyond simply making courses and presenting people information, again, back tying into real world results, real world application of those things. So those are some of my, from, from that perspective, um, my favorite episodes and the favorite conversations we've been able to have um, that, uh, that I really feel have the, the, you know, there's definitely, you know, there's some substance there that I can, that I will go back to from time to time and refresh on, et cetera, and say, okay, what was that again, et cetera. I mean, as I say, every conversation, every time we, we you know, every folks, every person who comes on brings something important to, um, to 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 the session and the, and the topic at hand, um, but if I think about the practical, the practices that I that I uh, w would focus on, it's it, those are some of the folks that I came away with the most notes. Even though I'm not, I'm not really able to take notes, but because <laughs> you know, people don't want to see the top of my forehead as I'm writing down in my notebook, but I'm going, oh geez, I got to remember that. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, I will be sure to put the URL to your uh, podcast series in the show notes of this YouTube video. But Chris, let me bring our interview to a close here with one final question. Uh, again, assuming that our audience is felt relatively new to the field, uh, what would be your words of advice, your counsel to them uh, as they enter into the world of learning and development? I, I 
I'm, I'm really stumped on this one because it feels like too concise, right? We, so many people come into what we do by side doors. Um, my own experience leaving journalism coming in. Um, a lot of people are, you know, the expert in something, and then you're asked to put together a training program to teach other people because you know the most about that thing, or you know, and then discovering that you like it, or, or uh, etc. Um, my my joke, and I've done, I've said it so many times on idiotic, but uh, on the, the high school careers day, there was no booth for instructional design or or training, etc. That might have been for you know for teaching or something like that, but it's not even a thing anybody really thinks about until you're into the working world and you get to be subjected to training and, and uh, you know or, or whatever. So um, you know there is so much to learn, and and my I guess my core advice would be um, look for look for the the, the learning opportunities that are going to help you improve what you're doing versus versus maybe the the apprenticeship model that so many of us have. Here's what we do. And it's my own experience. Here's what we do. We make this thing. Um, okay. How do we make that thing better? How do we, and what, what's the evidence that, you know, the backup for, for doing something, you know, that's, that's going to change that. And it's tough because you, you know, you're new on a job, you're working with a team of five people and then everybody makes, you know, you know, well, there's, you know, peer pressure to not, and you're, you know, don't, don't, don't break the, <laughs> don't rock the boat, you know, that, you know, that kind of a thing. But, you know, there's a lot of research out there. We just, uh, we just need to go find it and and then, and then bring it into the, into the practices that we have. Chris, thanks so much for uh, sharing with us today and uh, look forward to uh, watching that 200th Mm -hmm. podcast and uh, up to the 300th or however far you intend to take all of us. But mm -hmm. thank you so much for, for sharing with us today. Oh, my pleasure, Guy. It was an honor to be invited and I'm glad we made time for this. Thank you. Bye-bye.